What happened 47 years ago in the New Mexico desert? Did a UFO really crash in the middle of the night? And if it wasn't a UFO, what was it? And is the government covering up the story of the century? Well, one thing is for sure. There are an awful lot of unanswered questions. And tonight, we're going to try and sort out facts from fiction concerning an alleged alien encounter out in the New Mexico desert. And also, its connection to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Plus a few startling evidence pieces that show that the story did not end there. On the morning of July 3rd, Mac Brazel finds some rather unusual wreckage scattered across his property. Whatever happened here in early July of 1947 has permanently linked Dayton, Ohio to Roswell, New Mexico. And it put a sheep rancher in Lincoln County at the center of one of the longest running controversies in U.S. history. What did Mac Brazel find scattered across his property? Could it have been what the government first said it was, a crashed flying saucer? Wreckage scattered over a large area. Witnesses describing it as lightweight and super strong beams with strange drawings and foil-like material that had a memory. Uh, there were a lot of people that believed that we had something unique, otherwise we wouldn't have. Walter Hawk was the Roswell Army Airfield public information officer. And he was ordered to release the story that the government had indeed recovered a crashed saucer on Brazel's ranch. His friend, intelligence officer Jesse Marcel, was one of the first military men at the debris site. Jesse had gone out to the uh, ranch with Brazel and picked up a bunch of material and brought it back to the base. That material was flown to uh, General Ramey's office. And according to other reports, some of it came here to Dayton. A lot of this material, there were very few people saw. A lot of it was put on trucks out at the site, or covered, taken to aircraft, and the aircraft flown either to Wright Field or wherever else they may have gone. That's when the official story was changed. The Army Air Corps said Brazel had found nothing more than a downed weather balloon, and they had pictures to prove it. Intelligence officer Major Jesse Marcel was ordered to pose for pictures with some of the wreckage and told not to talk to the media. If it was a government plan, it worked. The story died. It was nothing very uh, serious. I think most people took it as an honest mistake made by the people off the base. For many years, no one in this New Mexico town thought much more about the story until a few of them started comparing notes. Jesse Marcel talked to Walter Haught and admitted he didn't buy that crashed weather balloon story. He was very, very adamant. Uh, what we picked up and brought into the base was not of this earth. Uh, he could not change his opinion. He was, it was, uh, this was not of this earth. We don't have the technology to develop anything like this. Materials that were so thin, they were like foil that you could crumple up in your hand and when you released it, it went back to its original form. It had a memory built in it. Go ahead and get out of here and get out of here as fast as you can. And in a rare interview, mortician Glenn Dennis told me he remembered getting some strange calls from the base mortuary officer around the time of the Brazel discovery. He uh, called one and he said, what's the smallest size hermetically sealed casket that you keep in stock? And then again, here again, I said, hey, what have you guys got out there? Later that day, while on an ambulance run to the base hospital, Dennis saw a strange wreckage in the back of two Army ambulances parked outside this emergency room door. And an Army nurse, who was a close friend of his, told him that she had been part of some strange activities going on in the hospital that day. And what they wanted her to do was write down what they were doing. And on one gurney, there was a crash bag that had two small, little, very mutilated bodies. And then on the other gurney, there was a crash bag there that was unzipped and it had a, a little body, she said, that was almost complete. It hadn't been mutilated. She claimed they were doing an autopsy on that one. 
a body that was not like anything she had ever seen before. She described some very unusual features that were not human. It only had four fingers, and on the tips of it were little pads, and, and then it looked like very small, minute little suction cups. Then they described the arm as much larger here from the human, and very short joint up here, and the head was, was very large, the eyes were very sunken in. But what were they? Dennis was told by a high-ranking military officer that they were indeed something special. He said the bodies were definitely aliens. All right, so what did Mac Brazel really find out in the desert? The weather balloon doesn't carry passengers, and it wasn't all that secret. And where did the bodies come from? What about those reports as well that both wreckage and alien bodies were shipped to Wright Pat? Well, coming up, we'll try and track down exactly what was and was not shipped here, and why the Roswell case is still under the microscope after all these years. Plus, we're going to find out what the Air Force has to say on this possible alien encounter. Again, it's an... ...started attracting real attention around 1979, when some well-established researchers, including Stan Friedman, Bill Moore, Kevin Randall, and Don Schmidt, started to dig into the story. Witnesses talking about another crash site, miles from the Brazel Ranch, and alien bodies. Also, rumors of a right pat connection grew. This teletype from the FBI office in Dallas to the one in Cincinnati mentions a disc and balloon being sent to Wright Field for examination. And Army Air Corps pilot Pappy Henderson admits that he flew wreckage of a crashed saucer from Roswell to Dayton, and he tells a friend that he saw alien bodies. The question is today, 1994, where is the material? Where are the bodies? Certainly unique specimens would have been preserved. Sure. Authors and researchers Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt have just released the latest book on the Roswell case. And they told me witnesses have shed even more light on the story. We've talked to both civilians and, and, and military who were there. We have over 50 sworn affidavits uh, attesting to personal involvement in this case. And more than one witness has mentioned government cover-up. The Provost Marshal Edwin Easley now, who mentioned over and over again that I'm still sworn to secrecy, yet before he died, he acknowledged his involvement, the bodies, and that the president, whether personally or indirectly, had asked them to cooperate and never to say a word about this. And about that right pat connection? We have first-hand testimony that there were two separate body flights that went out early morning of July 6th, uh, sometime between 2 and 3 in the morning that there were two flights. One went on to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. And we can only imagine who may have been interested in possibly uh, seeing the contents within the bomb bay. And the other flight went on the right field. All right, some amazing allegations as to what might have been shipped to Wright Pat following the crash at Roswell. Well, recently we went on base to try and find some evidence to back up the witness statements and also try and prove or disprove the allegations and also some long-standing rumors. We got some answers and a few surprises. This is Area B at Wright Pat, and behind me, a cluster of buildings and hangars. Now, most of the old rumors were that the bodies and wreckage were kept in Hangar 18. Well, first of all, there never was a Hangar 18. There is a Building 18, but it's home to Wright Lab, and it never has been home to Foreign Technology Division, which is the division that you would have expected to have been in charge of the wreckage and the bodies. We checked base civil engineering maps that show everything above and underground. And those rumored secret underground storage vaults and tunnels just don't show up. But a recent article in Far Out magazine claims Building 620, that's the avionics lab up on the hill, has access to secret vaults through a tunnel under the auditorium. So, using the map in the magazine, we found a tunnel. And here it is. Sources confirm it's the only tunnel under that building. We found no vaults of any kind, plus the building wasn't built until the mid-60s. So, what happened to the wreckage from Roswell? Well, the Air Force agreed for the first time to talk about it. Had there been In an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with a man who heads this sprawling complex known as the Air Force Foreign Aerospace Science and Technology Center, we got some surprising answers. The obvious first question, had were alien been, bodies and wreckage recovered from a crash at Roswell, happened. and were they brought to Wright Pat? We've extensively researched that, kind of hoping that we might find, yeah. uh, find after all these years that really there was some threat of truth. 
and we've had no success at all. And I know today there are no, no such vehicles or bodies on the base. If they were. If we're to believe that Roswell was nothing more than a weather balloon crash, why would it have been brought here in the first place? If it was easily identified as a weather balloon, probably it wouldn't have been. Okay. Uh, if it were a foreign weather balloon, it may have been. Uh, if it were unidentified, it would be brought here because, in fact, that is our job, to look at uh, technology and technological advances in any sense. Well, that seemed to be a pretty good argument that it was not an everyday weather balloon. And if it wasn't alien bodies and a UFO, what was it? Extensive research here, we found just no indication at all of, uh, of any kind of incident at Roswell. I mean, we have nothing on record for that investigation. But we did learn that there was a Roswell file in one base office. Meet Colonel Hector Quintanilla. He was the last director of the Air Force's Project Blue Book. There was a folder. Okay. A folder about as big as this with uh, newspaper accounts of what transpired out at the ranch or wherever it was. But uh, there was no formal uh, correspondence that I could find with regards to Roswell. He told me Blue Book's evaluation of the case was it was nothing more than a balloon, and that's the end of it. But interestingly enough, a search of other Air Force documents failed to turn up any reference to Roswell in any form. We can't find an advantage to keeping such a thing a secret. We think that probably what happened is that there wasn't anything significant from the Roswell uh, incident, if in fact it was evaluated here. Uh, consequently, if there was either no report or the report was of no significance, so it was destroyed. And he added, nothing like aliens or a UFO could have arrived at Wright Pat without somebody knowing about it and eventually talking. Almost impossible to keep something that fantastic a, a secret specifically within the intelligence community and particularly from the organization that's supposed to evaluate that sort of thing. Secret. We've heard that word a lot tonight. Well, coming up, we've got some new evidence that may well explain what at least some of that wreckage from Roswell really was, and why it came here, and why the government chose to keep it a secret. We'll be back. The official story it was nothing more than a weather balloon that crashed near Roswell, New Mexico, back in July of 47. And there are as many theories as there are UFO investigators. But every one of them agrees on one fact. Something unusual crashed right here on Mac Brazel's ranch near Corona, and the government covered it up. And they also claim more wreckage and bodies were found at other locations. First site mentioned near the plains of St. Augustine. That was way over in this area. And the most recent site, Randall and Schmidt's brand new theory, is closer to Roswell, probably about this area. Well, we've uncovered a pretty good explanation for at least one crash, the one on Brazel's property. If you look at Mac Brazel's original description of what he found on his ranch, lightweight beams with strange purple markings that resembled flowers and foil-like material that kept its shape, our investigation found that that matches the type of materials used in a top-secret high-altitude spy project known as Mogul. It was far different in materials and mission from any common weather balloon. Now, let me show you the difference. Coming up is a drawing of a mogul weather balloon, one of the configurations. A lot of balloons, suspended pieces down here, exotic materials, and from top to bottom, it stretched over 600 feet. And it was designed to spy on the Russians to keep track of their nuclear tests. And it had an above top secret project clearance. Now, mogul project manager, Professor Charlie Moore, told me it was not uncommon for that giant mogul balloon to be mistaken for a UFO. When Moore and his mogul team learned of the flap over the Roswell incident, he said they laughed, but they kept quiet about their project. Moore identified the wreckage in the Jesse Marcel picture as a mogul ML-307B that had been launched from Alamogordo, New Mexico. He confirmed a crash would have spread wreckage over a large area. And why wouldn't anyone have recognized it? Well, Moore said no one around Roswell had ever seen one. Moore was even cleared to know about mogul flights. And that's probably why the wreckage was sent to Wright Pat. Now, there's one more twist that tends to back up the mogul theory. The former top man with Project Mogul, Colonel Marcellus Duffy, was at Wright Pat when the Roswell wreckage arrived. He recognized it, but that story never got out. 
According to another former Mogul officer, retired Air Force Colonel Albert Trukowski, Colonel Duffy could not talk about it because of the secrecy. So, if it was a giant Mogul spy in the sky that went down on Brazel's ranch, something else must have crashed nearby, something with small passengers. Mogul officials can't explain that. Well, more than a few witnesses claim they saw bodies. Like a man identified as a former Air Force physician who related what an intelligence officer told him about strange bodies and a right pat connection. The beings on that uh, spacecraft, he relates, were uh, not anything that he could identify from our planet. They did not appear like any human being he'd ever see, but they were obviously uh, not anything else. So they obviously were living human beings, and uh, some of them were injured, most of them were dead. Uh, they were taken uh, by he and a number of other individuals uh, to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at that particular point in time. And uh, he said they were put there for uh, uh, later uh, evaluation, identification, examination uh, uh, by the Air Force and by the military. Now, when we come back, possibly the first physical evidence that more than just wreckage from a top secret project came to Wright Pat. Plus some pictures that could prove UFOs are real. Well, we've had great photographic proof for years. The question is the resistance to accepting it as being proof. Brown Hospital on the grounds of the VA Medical Center in Dayton. And up until a few years ago, it was a very active hospital. And on the third floor of this building, there was the dental lab. In that lab, a dental technician. We'll call him Jack Smith. And as Jack told the story to Len Stringfield, it was on a Thursday. He remembers the day quite well because Thursdays were normally very quiet days here at the VA Medical Center. And two men he identified as officers from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base brought him a model, an impression of a lower jawbone. They wanted a working model made. He was to keep no records, and the mold he created to make the model was broken and thrown in the trash as the Air Force officers left. Smith retrieved the broken mold pieces and put them back together at home, and he made his own model. He said he knew this just wasn't human. Few have ever seen it, and those that have can't identify it. An article in Len Stringfield's new book quotes certified dental technician Bruce Phillips as saying it's not like anything he'd come across in his 20 years in the business. The teeth are flat, no cutting surfaces. The shape of the jaw is different from humans, and the arch is much deeper. If it isn't identifiable as animal or human by people who should know, what is it? Could this finally be the first hard evidence the Air Force was indeed doing tests on alien bodies out at Wright Pat? Jack Smith says the jawbone model was made in 1979. And if you compare the shape of the jaw in the model with the shape of the jaw in this computer drawing of an alien, it's almost a perfect match. Some sources claim the drawing was part of a government UFO briefing in 1978, same time frame and was based on photos from Wright Pat. Now, the Air Force tells us they have no records of any alien picture or the briefing. No comments yet on the jawbone. For believers, this is more evidence that something is going on, and the government really doesn't want to talk about it. But are models and pictures enough to finally prove that UFOs and aliens are real? Well, we've had great photographic proof for years question is the resistance to accepting it as being proof. We Dr. Bruce Maccabee is one of the most respected experts in the field of photo analysis. And Bruce says some pictures taken near Gulf Breeze, Florida back in January by Ed Walters would have been pretty tough to fake. The first picture shows an unidentified object with an F-15 closing in. The next shows the plane flying by the object. Uh, here you have a situation where uh, the airplane actually got in between the camera and the object. Walters claims the plane made a U-turn and the object flew away at high speed. Maccabee showed me videos of other sightings around Gulf Breeze at around the same time, and they were ones that were hard, if not impossible, to explain. Skeptics have often said, you know, if this stuff were real, you would have photos and videos. 
what can I say? <laughs> now you've got photos and videos. Now you've got photos and videos. It's interesting to note, the Air Force has never said that UFOs don't exist. Was this a break in a curtain of secrecy surrounding the real UFO story? Has the government really been covering up the story of the century? It all comes down to what you believe. And as in the past, it remains the controversy that won't die. And whether the evidence connecting Wright Pat to the UFO phenomena is accurate or not, the base is forever a part of that legend. I'm Carl Day.